All right, uh, so let's start. This is the last but not least uh, talk of the workshop. And it's a pleasure to uh, welcome back Paula Farabowski, this time as a virtual speaker. Uh, Paula is a VP and HP uh, and a fellow at HPE. And uh, he's now uh, running the AI lab group. Uh, it, uh, and he's gonna tell us about you know, what the future holds for HPE and their vision of AI. So Paulo, please take it from here. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Again, uh, thanks for staying up late in Europe. I'm um, in California, so this was a good, um, you know, compromise. And I'm um, glad to be back uh, virtually at EPFL, where I've, I've been several times, and uh, hopefully you'll find this talk um, interesting. As Babak said, um, I have a new job, and um, I'm now uh, leading the AI lab, which is a small group um, responsible for advancing some of the AI technologies within HP and with our customers. And I'll give you a little glimpse of what we think the problems are and some of the things we're doing, a couple of projects that I think consider interesting and draw some conclusion for the futures. But before we go there, some of you may be puzzled uh, by the title of the talk. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with the picks and shovel, um, you know, terminology that, that actually um, came from, uh, you know, the California gold rush in the, in the 1800s, uh, where it turned out that when they looked at it in retrospective, it was, you know, everybody was going for gold, but it, it ended up that very few people actually uh, became rich out of gold. But, you know, who had a great business where the folks who were selling the picks and shovels to the miners, and by the way, also the blue jeans and some of the other stuff, but the terminology picks and shovels became sort of, you know, a synonym of, of the technologies that are sort of corollary to a new, uh, you know, a gold rush that are important and in some cases even more important to enable that technology and that's what I'm going to focus in here and so if you think about you know the AI world today you know there's a lot of in, you know interest and emphasis on sort of the AI deep learning core algorithms but there's I think that there's not enough you know attention paid to you know the the enablers of that technology and and, and in the in the AI world what I call picks and shovels are you know the good old ETL at the end of the day data preparation tools to clean up the mess are you know foundational because if you don't if you have you know bad data you get bad results right that's nothing uh, terribly new but you know a lot of people tend to ignore that part um, you know auto ml tools to help pick the right models uh, deployment tools you know workflow workflow orchestrators which you know people talk a lot about ml ops it's kind of this, the ops the deployment part of the of the DevOps for machine learning that also include deploying at the edge. And I'll talk about that in a couple of um, examples. And then, uh, you know, what happens after you deploy? You know, this is a new, uh, this is a new environment where there's a model running, um, you know, inference on something that, you know, you trained ahead of time. So you've got to verify that, you know, you have you know, that your data set hasn't drifted away from your training set, for example, you have to be able to explain if something goes wrong. And, you know, the more these uh, technologies become real and applied to real world problems, then, you know, things like liability and so on need to be taken into account. And finally, sort of, you know, the, uh, what I would call the unloved child of all this um, area is the underlying data layer. You know, data needs to be in the right place at the right time and at the right cost. It's easy enough to get a lot of data in tiers that are reasonably cold, uh, which are gonna make all your accelerator clusters completely useless because you can't get the right data at the right time, at the right performance level. And today there isn't a single solution to address all of these problems. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the challenges there. Uh, by the way, do you wanna do um, uh, questions at the end or you want me to take breaks? Um, and since we're doing virtually, I can do both. I mean, I, uh, So uh, the uh, Zoom has a participants feature and uh, people can raise their hand and I monitor the hands. So, oh, okay, so please interrupt you because I don't see that window in case there's, yeah, any, I'll, there's any questions. I'll, okay, I'll interrupt you. All right, so there's four things I wanna tell you today. One is sort of, you know, where do we see uh, the status of um, sort of the AI journey in enterprise? And, and when I refer to enterprise, it's, I'm not referring to uh, where AI, where, where the revolution on deep learning happened, which is primarily in the consumer side of internet service providers, right? 
So I'm talking about the more traditional enterprise that have started adopting AI pretty significantly, but they are in a very different stage. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of these edge to cloud pipelines that I mentioned and bring an example in the um, in, in some project that we've been working on uh, recently in autonomous driving, uh, as well as another example in a project that we've been working with in um, the use of AI for IT. In, in the first case, the use of IT to actually enable AI. The second example is the use of AI to help IT in, for you know, AI for IT operations at um, facilities level with, with, a, with a, a supercomputing partner in the US. And last, um, I'm gonna to touch a little bit on what I described is sort of the data layer and some of the challenges that we see coming up for the next generation accelerators. I hope this is an interesting set of topics uh, for you. First, I need to put in a little bit of a, my, you know, bragging slides. Um, you know, after we acquired Cray, the combined HP Cray, um, you know, plans for the exascale generation, which is going to be the one that fuels the first uh, set of AI for science activities, is pretty big. I mean, we actually have all the three exascale machines in the US, in 21 uh, Argon with Aurora, in 21, late 21, the Frontier at Oak Ridge. And uh, as we announced uh, um, a couple of weeks ago, actually last week, I think, in, 20, in early 23, El Capitan for Livermore. So these are, um, as the slide said, they're not just machine. It's really a new era of computing. We're talking about one, one and a half, and two exaflops of peak. These are 64-bit, I mean, like grown-up exaflops, not the AI exaflops, right? And um, they're based on different architectures. Um, you know, Aurora is Intel, and uh, Frontier and El Capitan are IMD. They're all based on the slingshot interconnect uh, <coughs> that came from Cray. And as you see, they all gonna run some mix of AI and HPC workload. And I'll touch a little bit of that, on that later. And, uh, you know, Argonne and, and Oak Ridge are Office of Science. So they're gonna run uh, primarily science, um, um, you know, workloads and um, Livermore is a mission, um, you know, lab. So they're gonna run uh, primarily HPC simulation, but as you'll see, you know, they actually are AI assisted. And what is interesting is that, um, you know, AI and HPC and science are colliding and are actually, um, the expectation is that once we, uh, you know, go past the exascale generation, there's gonna be a lot stronger emphasis on AI. For this generation, uh, those three machines were kind of designed really for traditional HPC simulation with a little bit of AI, uh, but the next generation is gonna be designed primarily for AI. And the reason for that, and I borrowed this slide from a town hall meeting that I attended uh, with the Office of Science in the US um, late last year, is that there are a lot of uses of AI in science that go well beyond what people uh, think about using it today. The first column is the classical one, classifying uh, data to do things like you know, regression and clustering. The other three columns are coming up, but are coming up strong. So for example, inverse problems are basically reconstructing models from their output. So for things like, um, uh, you know, astronomy or, or, uh, or um, you know, uh, X-ray tomography and something like that. It's basically a black box problem. You see, um, you know, your observations and you want to reconstruct the model. You want to find, uh, you know, signals in very noisy environments and so on and so forth. The surrogate models are also very interesting. They're basically coupling a simulation with a deep learning um, tool that um, helps to do approximation and by doing that, it gains all the way up to like four orders of magnitude of acceleration. The examples that a lot of people have seen is probably in like computational fluid dynamics where, you know, when you're trying to find turbulence around a certain shape, you can actually use a model that was trained on a lot of other CFD simulations on different shapes and kind of ex extrapolates that, you know, around that corner, you know, it will tell you where to zoom in your simulation. And by doing that, people are seeing in you know, a thousand X improvement in, uh, in uh, in sort of the the, um, the simulation performance, and finally, and that's where I'm I'm going to spend a little bit more time later. There's also uses of AI that are expected in the full edge to cloud, or edge to um, supercomputer in this case uh, scenarios. Things like um, AI driven 
or AI automated um, you know, instrumentation, I'm talking about big instrumentation like particle accelerator, laser sources and th something like that, where the idea is they wanna get the scientists out of the uh, instrumentation control loop and you know, the scientists should spend their time actually thinking about designing the experiments and not writing the scripts to, to move the instrument. And so AI can help a lot to automate that. And this is a full, uh, you know, it's a big edge. It's a, the, as the, the, the labs call it a heavy edge, but it's still sort of an edge where, you know, you don't have all the computational power and that you gotta sort of figure out how to juggle the work between the edge and the cloud. And, uh, and this is my last, uh, or a slide talks about science because then I'm going to move more into the enterprise. What is interesting and the reason why we're working very closely with some of the DOE labs um, in other parts of the world, in the US and other parts of the world, is because we think that uh, this use of AI in science does challenge every aspect of deep learning and machine learning uh, from, you know, very different data. Data it tends to be as they call it, uh, bit rich and information poor, which is very different from the hyperscaler world where you have um, you know, small images and a lot of labels. Here you have very big images or very big data sets and very sparse labels. Um, it has to be physics informed. In um, you know, it doesn't actually matter a lot of violate when you're playing, you know, image uh, so if you have a wrong uh, point in simulation, you end up um, violating a laws of physics. That's not good. Things blow up and you know, bad things happen. You scale at the level of, you know, beyond exascale as, uh, as we, as I talked about, but also you need to uh, provide some level of uh, quality and, uh, you know, uncertainty quantification has been a fundamental um, uh, principle of all the simulation and it does not change when you're using AI. So you need to be able to quantify your errors. You need to understand causal inference. You need to understand why an AI is making certain decision or is picking certain parts of the simulation space. And as I mentioned, some of the workflows. So, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty involved in that and, uh, and we're trying to use, um, you know, these engagements to learn and influence and, you know, collaborate with some of the scientists working on some of these areas and then translate some of these learning into more of the enterprise world. Uh, what we're doing at labs and uh, is, uh, you know, taking a, an angle, um, as I said, we're a small group um, on, the, on the AI problem. We're not really working on the core AI algorithm. We're kind of trying to understand how to help some of our customers, enterprise customer in advancing their AI journey. Specifically, we have, uh, you know, some research going on for the edge, um, you know, the whole edge core AI computing. Um, we have a little project around, um, you know, federated AI, which we call swarm learning, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, then we're working on, as I mentioned, um, you know, data-driven science, combining AI and simulation. There's interesting technology, um, you know, that we inherited with the Craig Group that, um, you know, combines simulation with, uh, with AI. And then we're also doing a little bit of work on unconventional accelerator. You might have seen some papers, uh, I think it's last year, ASPLOS, um, that talks about, you know, Puma, which is sort of a, um, you know, analog computing um, and, uh, you, know, you know, digital counterpart uh, work um, around, um, you, know, you know, deep learning inference using uh, a dot product engine, which is sort of an analog uh, array. All right, so uh, moving on to uh, sort of the first of the three topics I wanna mention, you know, where are we in the enterprise? Um, if you're familiar with uh, sort of what I call consumer internet AI, which is sort of, uh, you know, what has been the fuel for the, the, the revolution of AI in the last, you know, seven, 10 years, it's been primarily image and voice application, right? So these are the Google and Facebook and Amazon and Microsoft of the world who had a lot of good label data and a lot of images and a lot of people that crowdsourced the, the, the ground truth and the labels of that. So they could use it to train and develop new, you know, incredible uh, algorithms that really are a breakthrough. Uh, the, the world beyond hyperscaler is very different, right? You know, primarily, uh, you know, about 80% of um, the enterprise customers today, of our enterprise customer, which represent a fairly good, you know, sample of the world, because, you know, we're, we're one of the global IT vendors, are in the early or proof of concept stage. And when I say early, 
I mean, they don't have the skills, they don't have the data, and they don't have the compute. And uh, when I say, you know, proof of concept, they kind of figured out that they have some data, they're trying to understand where they are from the point of view of, uh, you know, what problems they're really trying to solve. Do they have the compute? Should they buy, you know, a rack or two of GPU enabled servers? You know, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna measure my ROI, my return on investment in this technology? And they're starting to write models or, you know, you know, get, you know, go to Kaggle, pick up a model, adjust it for their needs and run it. And then there's only about 20% that have moved from proof of concept to production. And now they're thinking about, all right, how do I scale it? How do I look at the model if it's doing what I think it's doing? Do I need to worry about my data ethics and my data governance and provenance problem? You know, how do I move it to the next phase? So as you see, I mean, there are lots of, our, of, of the customers out there in the enterprise and commercial world, they're actually pretty early. And so we need to kind of hold them by the hand and move them, you know, through their journey in AI. And, and uh, you know, you might have seen uh, this kind of picture uh, in a different other, um, you know, form because everybody's realizing that it's very easy to get a proof of concept. There's a lot of great tools out there. You know, can go download your Jupyter notebook, you know, download the model, you know, put together your TensorFlow environment in a matter of maybe a day or two and maybe a few weeks, you get a proof of concept up and running. And now you say, I'm going to move it into production. And, you know, 18 months after that, you're still struggling with it. And in some people, some cases, people give up. And, and the reason for that is because, you know, you start with your data, your data transformation, what you want to do, and and your ML code, then you're moving, you know, building around it. So you say, okay, I need to optimize my model, make sure I can verify it. I'm a, I'm a, where am I going to find my data? I need to federate different data lakes. How am I going to ingest it? And then I say, all right, now I guess I'll start building my pipeline. Is my pipeline actually performing in the right way? So I need to put monitoring and scalability analysis tools in place. Then I need to think about, you know, the inference part. Once I've trained my model, I need to manage it. I need to deploy the in inference. I need to test it, figure out if I drift it and retrain it. Possibly I need to move it to the edge and, you know, the tools and libraries. Then I have to look at, you know, my whole security, you know, who's going to access that, who's going to orchestrate the containers and deploy the pipelines. And finally, I'm going to have to look at the infrastructure, you know, in my management software, my accelerators, you know, resource management, compute performance, and so on. So this is a mess, right? I mean, when we start from the, your kind of, you know, Jupyter notebook on your, lap, on your laptop and you get something running, you've only scratched the surface and then everything else is, is where, you know, the kind of the, what I call the picks and shovels of AI come into play. So uh, why are people fighting and you know, struggling to uh, move at high speed? I mean, because there's a lot of data, right? That's not something new, but the data is not in one place. This is the good old EPL problem of data warehousing. I got data, but I got it in different silos. They have different governance and access um, rights. I mean, I have finance data and I got HR data and I got you know, customer data. They don't talk to each other for good reasons, right? So I, I need to break those silos, but in a way that, you know, still gives me governance and doesn't break the law, for example. Uh, you know, as a lot of people are, you know, buying a lot of GPUs, they're seeing, uh, you know, a surge in their cost and they're not really, you know, finding the, the way to understand what the ROI on those costs are. The, the box in the middle is the big one, lack of AI talent because of the importance of AI in the hyperscale world, there is a scarcity of skilled AI resources in the world. And so it's very hard to get AI experts and even more so AI experts and data scientists that understand your problems. So you have, you know, maybe your domain science, but are not data scientists and vice versa. And then, you know, the, the, the open source ecosystem and the tools are not standard or moving very quickly and it's really hard to keep track of that. So uh, on top of that, the governments and various regulatory bodies around the world are waking up to the whole point of AI. And so they're putting together very rightly so, you know, governance and privacy rules that are something you cannot uh, think about in retrospect. You've got to think about that early on, otherwise you're in for big surprises. So, you know, what's a typical AI journey that, you know, a customer would do, you know, you start, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a 
customer, you select your application, you talk to your, your software vendor, or your system integrator, or you know, maybe you build your own. Then you go down and number two, you sort of you know, do your uh, orchestration plane, you implement, you define your, your pipeline and, and so on and so forth. You decide whether you wanna do it bare metal, when you wanna containerize it. And then you move into your infrastructure where um, you, know, you have to identify whether you have on-premise resources, where you don't wanna run on cloud or multiple cloud or you know, hybrid approach. And then, and that usually depends on where your data lives. And then you know you implement those changes, and then you go back up. You figure out your orchestration plane, your number five. You understand uh, you know your applications ready to use, and then you can sort of start beginning uh, you know your your application tests and so on and so forth. Somewhere in between, you got to figure out you know optimization planes like this A bucket that we have there to understand the optimization. So it's a complex world. That's what I'm trying to say, and we need to help uh, people navigate. So we have putting together, you know, a strategy that, uh, you know, we're sort of addressing it in kind of three different buckets. We're trying to solve the business problem uh, first to, uh, you know, help our customer identify, you know, what is the problem you're trying to solve. And someone told me that, you know, when you're having an AI conversation, if you cannot describe the problem to the customer without using the word machine learning or deep learning, then you should just leave. Right, because uh, you know, at the end of the day, AI shouldn't be the one you sell to the customer. It should be the problem you're trying to solve. And then, you know, we we are putting together an orchestration plane, mostly based on on open source tools and some proprietary technology, and infrastructure plane, mostly based on some of our own um, hardware and some partner hardware. Hopefully that was clear. Was that, I know was there, but had you know question on sort of introduction. I didn't see I didn't see anybody raising hands yet. I guess not. Uh, so let me move on. Um, uh, here's an example of an edge to cloud um, AI pipeline we've been working on. Um, I'm actually going to talk about you know the sort of the autonomous driving in principle, but you know we uh, have recently announced that um, we have a partnership with um, a um, you know a, a European automaker and uh, a spin-off. I mean this is Volvo and the Zenuity. Zenuity is a is a joint venture between Volvo and Deonair where they're putting together sort of the autonomous driving uh, pipeline and software. And uh, you know we're going to be working with them in the next few years to put together uh, the infrastructure to develop the next generation autonomous driving system. Now this is an announcement to just tell you that you know we're not doing these things in isolation in the lab, but we're actually working with our customer. Now the, the things I'm going to tell you about now, they're not actually related to Volvo, but they'll give you a feeling of the kind of problems that um, you know people are trying to address here. Um, it's probably obvious to all of you, but you know there, there's a degree of autonomy in autonomous driving uh, from basically your typical ADAS today, which is uh, you know assisted driving, acceleration, deceleration, and um, you know uh, spotting lane changes and so on, which are level one, level two, and then increasingly we're talking about hands off, eyes on, hands off, eyes off, you know hands off and mind off, and then no steering wheel, no driver, right? So while you know some of the U.S. automakers, uh, especially you know Tesla, Uber, and so on, they're looking at level five. Actually, it turns out that many of the European automakers are looking primarily at level three, which is what's referred to as highly HAD, highly automated um, assisted driving, which means you know you can take hands off and eyes off occasionally, but you still need to be available to take over. So you still do you know steering, acceleration, deceleration, lane changes, and so on and so forth. When I'm talking about um, in autonomous driving, um, there's really two parts of it. Uh, and the one I'm focusing on is the training part of it. So in other words, you, you probably have seen in um, you know, the city or the country of your choice, uh, fleets of instrumented test vehicles running around and collecting data, right? So these are look a little bit like that. So there is actually a vehicle a manufacturing specific, you know, assisted driving system. And then there is in uh, what I call an edge system, which is a collection system, which is like a, they rip off the back seats and put a mini data center in the back, which does the initial collection of all the, you know, sensor data, whether it's, you know, LIDAR, radar, telemetry from standard car, um, you know, uh, sensors and, and video. 
And uh, what they do is that, you know, either online because the driver could actually do some labeling while it's driving or offline by reviewing the video, they label that data uh, to identify anomalous events. And by doing that, they can help understand, you know, to train or retrain the various systems and the various AI systems they put in place. Um, so the people have, you know, companies that tend to have, you know, 50, 100, 200 vehicles uh, around the world um, that are you know, your, your test fleet. And the autonomous driving challenge is actually a training challenge is how to deal with all the logistics and AI of that. And so this is a through, you know, add to the problem. I mean, imagine that you have, you know, these 100 vehicles and that they're collecting a lot of data, right? Uh, the the in-vehicle um, networking is speed is growing very rapidly. Today, uh, there, I think they're in the 10 gigabit per second, which is sort of the second row on, on this challenge. So, you know, you have to think that they collect in, a, in an eight hour shift about 30 tera, 36 terabytes of data per car. Right, so if you have 80, 80 cars driving around, every day you produce 2.8 petabytes of data, right? That's a lot of data, right? You can't move it actually, um, you have to use uh, what used to be called sneakerware to move it around. You have to put, you know, disks on a truck or a FedEx or whatever, and then move it into an ingestion station where you're doing a lot of work you're doing simulation, you're doing, you know, understanding the ground truth, you identify some of the events that are anomalous and they are the ones that you want to send back to the data center. And then you send back to the data center, hopefully a subset of that data. Uh, well, I mean, you, you're going to ultimately send tapes or, you know, low cost media of all the data, but you want to send, uh, you know, a fresh subset of that data to be able to do, you know, quick retraining so you can deploy a new model and the next day they're going to start, you know, running with a new model and something like that. So uh, this whole uh, pipeline is truly an edge to cloud uh, pipeline because you got elements uh, everywhere, right, of compute and storage everywhere. You got in the car. And then you got an ingestion station, which is sort of the edge, big edge device or big edge, um, you know, aggregator. And then you have multiple distributed data center. They all kind of working towards the same problem. This is a very different problem than if you're kind of, you know, working within a single sort of hyperscale data center and running a, you know, a, a uh, I'm sorry, a recommender algorithm to pop up an ad or something like that. As you can imagine, there's logistics, there's data moving around, there's, you know, physical constraints of networking and bandwidth and so on and so forth. But this is real world, right? That's why I'm saying that initially that, you know, the real world sometimes looks very different from some of the problems that you might see in literature. It's uh, also- oh, I yeah. have a question. I have a question. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So uh, are you, are these, uh, is this infrastructure hosted at towers or within a certain proximity? No, they're completely distributed. You have to imagine that these um, uh, fleets, they're actually running around different cities in the world. So you can imagine some of them in, in, in Japan, some of them are running in the US, some of them in Europe, because you wanna collect a variety of data because you wanna learn you know, different environments. So there's a distributed set of data centers, there's a distributed set of collection stations, and there's you know cars running around all over the place. So it is truly a distributed, um, completely distributed, um, infrastructure right but you you the, the the one of the constraints would be proximity to some data center basically in this picture no well not really because what happens well there's there's different levels of proximity i mean basically there's a there's like two data centers here the ingestion station is sort of a a mini warehouse or think of it a garage in some cases where the cars go in there and you know they get their data uploaded and then you know then the ingestion station is connected through WAN or something else to um, the data, you know, bigger data center where you want to do the training, right? Or multiple data centers where you want to do the training and then those data centers need to exchange their data. So the, 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 on, the only proximity is really between the fleets and their ingestion station. Anything else doesn't have to be, and it's actually not in, in some of the customer deployments we have seen because they tend to want to have the data centers close to where, um, sort of the research teams are so that they don't pay the latency to get to the data. Uh, but, you know, the cars are not and the ingestion stations are not. So it's a, it's a complex environment. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. 
uh, also, uh, you know, the, the, the next frontier is to, uh, you know, move some of the computation in the car itself, because, uh, you know, even when you're moving up in speed and you're going to the 20 gigabit per second or 30 gigabits per second, now we're talking about, you know, 100 terabytes per day, per shift, per car, and you can't expect to kind of move that around easily. There's a cost and there's also, you know, physically, the, you know, the, the, even, even put things on a track there's only so much bandwidth you can get out of it. Um, and so, you know, there, the, the idea is that the car itself might become, it might start using AI to do intelligent data logging and sort of, you know, only identify events that are meaningful and send those to the fast channel and then use a slow channel or, you know, kind of more of a backup archiving path to kind of keep the data in case someone wants to re-examine it in the future or because of regulatory issues, of course. And uh, and so it's kind of becoming a mix between you know, autonomous driving and connected uh, car, a world where you're going to have a mix of the two. And um, and I'm not even talking about you know the deployment into the consumer car beyond that. So this is just for the training part, which is pretty complicated. Any question on this before I move on? Uh, no, we're good. All right. So. Second thing I want to I want to talk about uh, is um, you know a different world, but you'll see it may share some similarities in terms of you know this whole edge to cloud component, and this is using AI for operational intelligence, meaning to help you know run a data center. This is a collaboration we did with NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Lab. It's a supercomputing center in um, in Colorado, in the U.S. They have um, been uh, good customers. They've bought a couple of different uh, large machines from us. Um, last one's being Eagle. And um, they actually like to operate their entire facility and their IT in sort of, you know, in a coordinated way. And um, the challenge they have is that uh, you, when you look at the facilities level metrics in telemetry, you know, when you're talking about, you know, cooling towers and valves and so on and so forth, you got really a large number of metrics, you know, there's thousands of metrics. Each of them is producing, you know, things at the uh, Hertz uh, speed. Uh, doesn't have to be a lot faster than that. And you re quickly get to a very, very large number of metrics and a large number of collected um, um you know, IT and facility uh, data, and you don't really know where to look. And historically, people have put in place the usual set of threshold-based rules, like, oh, this is bigger than that, and this is smaller than that, and it's Wednesday, and it's raining. Then, you know, it means that there's an anomaly in place. But it's kind of hard to scale that to the number of metrics. And, and what happened is that historically, again, people have distilled down the metric to something that a human can handle. Um, you know, uh, in other words, like, you know, every, every control system at the end of the day is a PID and um, with only three parameters. And in this case, it's similar, right? I mean, even if you have a very set complex set of metrics, you have to distill it down uh, into something a human can digest. But then, you know, AI is where it can come to the rescue because AI is really good at, at finding correlation and, um, you know, trends in a very large number of metrics that a human might not be able to digest, right? And it's not just for anomaly detection. The, the first one is the obvious one, kind of predict something bad is going to happen before it happens. So I can, you know, shut down orderly rather than, you know, crash. But then there's predictive maintenance, understand that, you know, something's going to break and so I need to fix it and I can, you know, turn it off and move the workload. I can try to, you know, predict the performance and I can even try to optimize by sort of, you know, building kind of a digital twin or simulation model of my entire data center and try to optimize this PUE or something like that. That's what we want to do. So we've been in a collaboration with NREL and for a year and collaboration to extend another couple of years. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, millions of data points per minute. Uh, there is a, um, I hope you can still uh, hear me okay. My, um, I think my, they're warning me, my internet's not great, but Hopefully it's still fine. It, it goes away once every 10 minutes for just a few seconds. Oh, okay. Never mind then. Yeah, I got a warning from the, uh, but um, so 
there's a very different set of um, diversity of metrics. You know, some are modality, some have modality, some are stationarity, uh, some are sparse, some are regular. And, you know, we first need to do some amount of pre-processing. We need to figure out, you know, what kind of algorithm and what kind of, um, you know, time series analysis and, and you know, autocorrelation methods are appropriate. And then we need to fuse the information coming from these uh, different sensors and identify kind of root cause analysis. So there's a lot of words. Let me give you an example of the kind of things we've been doing. So right now we're running offline because, you know, they won't let us have their um, data for a variety of reasons. In other words, you know, they're giving, they're giving us historical data and we're kind of something if we can do predictive um, analytics, for example, on that one. So in this case, um, you know, we had a lot of metrics and there was an incident that happened a few years ago um, and that um, I think it was in 2015 and that it happened that there was a uh, valve uh, of, a, of a cooling tower that started malfunctioning and that, um, you know, it basically uh, created a chain effect of, uh, of bad things and that uh, caused the, the data center to pretty much shut down um, instantaneously, uh, you know, to avoid bigger damage. And, you know, there were warning signs, but they were completely missed because, you know, the thresholds were put in the wrong place, which was clearly, but, you know, of course, if you put the threshold below, then, then, then you end up with a lot of false alarms, which doesn't help either. So we ran this through uh, some of the, um, you know, time series analysis, and it turns out that, you know, through our time series analysis, we could have been able to detect that something bad was really going to happen, you know, about five minutes before the bad things really happened. So if we, if they had the system in place, that would have been a massive advantage because five minutes would enable you to basically shut down the workloads, orderly, you know, save the day, checkpoint, whatever you need to do. And, um, and then, you know, shut down the data center, fix the problem and restart without losing, you know, days or potentially months of work because things were just crashing. So those are the kind of things that this technology can help. But as I mentioned, I mean, it is also another edge to cloud platform because in this case, you know, the telemetry collection point, they don't come from the IT itself. They come from different sensors around uh, the facility. They need to be collected somewhere. They need to be made available uh, through the control plane and so on and so forth. And this is a complex problem. So, um, you know, we're putting together a system uh, which we call Krakenmire, which is a monitoring framework with open source uh, at some point that is able to absorb a very large number of events. This is the foundational to be able to then do from, from different sources, including at the edge. And this is the foundation that we need to put in place to then be able to do the advanced data analytics and then feed it into the automation and control. And since we have a multi-year collaboration with NREL, we'll hope that we'll be able to you know, advance that and, you know, put it together and then make it available for people if they want to play with it. So, which we think is pretty interesting. And, um, and it's a way to, um, you know, again, help a, a different flavor of edge to cloud, but still an important one for AI use for operational intelligence and, op and optimization. Moving right along to the last part. Um, I mentioned sort of the data plane as being a challenging um, aspects of it. And I want to give you a little bit of a feeling of uh, why we think it's challenging also from the computational perspective. I understand that, you know, this is at the end of the day, a lot of people in this community care all about performance and, and acceleration and so on. I want to give you a little bit of the, um, I, you know, IO perspective and of the challenges that are, that are coming up. Um, even today, if I look, and this is a, a little busy chart, but let me let me walk you through that. Uh, the, if you look at the top right, um, you know this is the required bandwidth per node, uh, and I'm talking about I/O bandwidth, so the training data bandwidth to feed a um, NVIDIA or oh, turning turning GPU star. Uh, interesting. Um, typo there, 4,200 gigabyte a second, depending on the computational intensity of the network. These are a bunch, I'm talking about training here, and I'm talking about, you know, a bunch of, uh, most of the, oh, these are convolutional neural networks. There's something that's a little different on the right, but they're kind of classical, you know, ResNet 50, VGG, and so on type, type networks. You see that the bandwidth 
is high, but is not crazy. Now, what is interesting is that if you scale this a little bit further out, I mean, today, how do you feed that bandwidth? Because, you know, even 100 gigabytes a second, you know, it's kind of getting out there for the, for the, uh, for a disk or an SSD. So the way in which people do that is they tend to cache the data set in DRAM, right? And, uh, but, you know, and, and the pictures on the left bottom, it sort of shows how you do it. Typically in a training, um, supervised training, what you do is, you know, you got your training data, you replicate, randomize, partition, then you cache it on the GPU server, run the training task, and then you try to, you know, run the mini batch on the cache data for as long as you can. Now, if you fast forward a little bit in, a, in, in the near future, you would, you know, more compute and, you know, bigger training set and bigger models, and you do your little law calculation, turns out you've got to start having to cache, you know, petabytes of data. Um, and that becomes, you know, an economical challenge because then you end up spending more on your cache in DRAM um, than, than you, you spend on your compute, which isn't, which isn't where you want to be. And so uh, there is a question of, you know, is there a better way to cache, you know, the data somewhere in your in your tier that doesn't use uh, you only use you know DRAM judiciously but uses some other tiers uh, in a way to that you can move the data at the right place at the right time. So we've looked at a, a couple of options. So for example, I mean, you can share the storage using um, using something like a, a high performance computing uh, I/O node and a sort of burst buffer type methodology. So you can tier. Uh, your data into um, a, a hot tier of, um, let's say, SSD-enabled servers with a lot of bandwidth from your data lake. And those would serve the compute nodes. Um, and the better network you have, like Slingshot, the better you're going to be in, uh, you, know, you know, reducing noise and, and long tail effects. Uh, and that way you can move, hopefully, a bunch of, um, of, of data from the training set into optimize your ratio between your accelerated nodes and your IO nodes to optimize your performance. So it's, it's flexible um, because, you know, you can decide the ratios you want, but, you know, you have to deal with interference because you've got traffic on the networking and you've got to deal with long tail effects. Unfortunately, the training is a, you know, last, last guy coming on the bus uh, besides the performance because you've got to do an all reduce, you know, periodically. And so, you know, if you have noise and if you have long tail effect, you end up slowing down your overall training. And then you have the, 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 the other obvious uh, approach, which is sort of, you know, define, identify and design a server that's optimized uh, for a combined caching and 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 training of data. Uh, you might have seen that um, you know some of the GPU vendors are are introducing something that is called GPU Direct, which basically means you the accelerators can access directly the NVMe uh, drives without going through the CPU staging in memory. Uh, which is already an improvement, uh, but it doesn't completely solve the problem because uh, now you can get a lot of local storage. Uh, you can have exclusive and fair access and reduce the memory traffic, but now you're adding cost um, and then you have a fixed ratio and then you still have to be able to stripe, um, you know, your data set across SSDs. And as far as I know, there's no GPU that today can read a striped, um, you know, data set. So there's a bit of, a little bit of challenges in moving into that direction. Good news is that CPUs are increasing their edge bandwidth, so you'll be able to attach a lot of these things into kind of modern CPUs with lots of PCI lanes. Uh, but still, you know, this is a, a, an unresolved uh, set of problems. And again, I'm not trying to give you a solution here, but I'm trying to tell you that, you know, there are, if I go back a couple of slides, you know, the trends are disturbing and there are lots of issues here that, um, you know, need to be addressed. Again, there, Sometimes ignore Jews more putting computing there, um, you know, the worse it gets to um, you know create the right balance between IO and compute, which is a classical problem, but in this case it's being exacerbated by uh, by by the compute. And um, the last thing I want to mention is, okay, how about we go, you know, two clicks ahead. Let's look at what happens with the, some of the extreme AI accelerators. Now, uh, we've all seen, um, I'm picking four here without any good reason, um, that 
that you know the next generation of accelerator is is gonna put a lot of compute into a single chip in some cases a big chip um, and you know the numbers I'm showing here are from like Graphcore, Grok, Habana, also known as Intel, and then Cerebras. And you know you're seeing numbers that go you know from hundreds of teraflops, 16 bits per second, to you know close to a petaflop uh, again, 16 bit. I'm talking about 16 bit floating point for training, not not inference here. And uh, you know for Cerebras, that that's the picture that I have on the, on the chart here, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, they built basically a wafer scale, um, you know, device, which is an eight and a half inch by eight and a half inch, kind of a pizza um, AI accelerator um, that, um, you know, they haven't produced a number in performance, but, you know, they have 400,000 cores per wafer. So if you do, so if, you know, your, your nominal gigahertz frequency and typical, you know, flops per watt, I mean, you're gonna end up in the several petabytes per second for sure, right? So um, you, you can see that, you know, the trend is, uh, is, is rapidly growing the compute performance per, um, you know, per unit of acceleration, if you want, if you want to say it that way. And, and then it's going to create a lot of trouble, right? So here, here is a projection we did uh, sort of a thought experiment of the IO arithmetic intensity of some of the normal model uh, that people are using today and some of they're ex expected to use um, in the near future. And this is a typical roof line uh, plot. So you can see the horizontal line is sort of your future, but not too crazy future looking 100 petaflop accelerator, uh, you know, cluster. And then, um, you know, the, the, the vertical lines are bandwidth for um, IO. And here we're talking about one, two, four terabytes a second. Now remember that, you know, producing four terabytes a second of from an IO system is not for the faint of art today, right? It is a pretty ambitious. And now if you look at where these uh, accelerate, uh, where these models are, you know, uh, some of the models like the one on the right that have really high computational um, um, I'm sorry, really um, um, high arithmetic intensity, we're okay because you've got a lot of compute um, per, uh, per IO, so you're fine. You can, you can stay, you know, under your roof line. But, you know, some of the ones in the, on the left, and some are small, like AlexNet and so on, they actually, you know, need very frequent training uh, data to be able to run it. And so these are going to be completely bandwidth bound. Remember, these are log charts. So if you're like, you know, a couple of clicks above uh, the roof line, it means that you're leaving uh, on the table, you know, 90% of your performance fundamentally of the accelerator. And then, you know, there's some models that are kind of near the roof line. And, uh, you know, hopefully with the software and some better, you know, squeezing techniques and so on and so forth, we can or reuse techniques, we can sort of, you know, uh, get there. Now, the disturbing part is that when you're looking at edge deployment, something like SqueezeNet, um, it's small uh, because you want to deploy it on an edge device, right? So it's not that, that you know, the small models are becoming obsolete. Uh, some are still important because if you want to deploy it on an edge device, it's got to be small. And those are the ones that are in sort of, you know, um, the un uncomfortable areas of arithmetic intensity. Anyway, I think that, Again, this is not a solution I'm trying to give you. I'm trying to point out that, you know, there's an area of research that I don't see being explored aggressively that I think people need to start uh, spending some time on to understand what is the impact on the on the IO side. And we're going to conclude now. So that if you, you want to keep three things in mind uh, from this talk is one, don't underestimate the roles of what I call the picks and shovel. They are today actually the biggest impediment to real world deployment in the enterprise and in the edge to cloud and so on. Um, the second takeaway is that the real world problems are very different from sort of what I call consumer internet AI for like image and voice. You know, we, we, we've shown an example on HAD, um, or Thomas driving on, you know, what it really means to build an edge to cloud AI pipeline. And the toughest challenge is the actual edge deployment, right? 
And third is that, you know, with the upcoming breed of a new crazy AI accelerator, the data pipeline challenges are gonna get a lot worse um, if we wanna take advantage of those. So be prepared to some new data architecture someone's gonna come up with to be able to address those. And with that, I'm gonna stop and see if people have a few questions. Thank you, Paulo. Uh, just wanted to comment that uh, Cerebra, actually one of their co-founders is from EPFL. So it's, Who's that? Uh, it's the French gentleman. I don't remember their, his name, but he is, he's actually an EPFL alumni. He was he graduated of EPFL. Maybe oh, actually EPFL alumni from SDI, from engineering. Um, Excellent. Yeah, uh, so let's see. If you want to ask questions, please click on participants and click on raise hand. So I would ask the first question then. Uh, it's quite interesting, uh, your sort of portrayal of what, what's gonna come, especially with Edge. Uh, obviously, you know, the companies that you work with, they're gonna be hosting infrastructure and they continue hosting infrastructure. And uh, do you foresee some of these AI accelerators then being commodity parties that can then be hosted in such infrastructure? Uh, it, it will depend. On, uh, th there's a variety of, of uh, scenarios, right? I mean, the as a service one is clearly a big trend, right? So if you're saying hosting infrastructure, I think you're, you know, we usually call that offering things as a service, meaning that. Um, you know, you have different uh, levels of uh, whether it's infrastructure as a service or whether you offer MLOps as a service or an API or something like that uh, to run your machine learning. Um, um, so, so that's one of the possible scenarios. But, you know, in, in some of these deployments, like example, the autonomous driving, a lot of people would want the hybrids, right? They would want to have, uh, you know, part of it that it's hosted but part of it that, you know, they own themselves, you know, like the, the fleets, um, the, the, you know, test vehicle fleets and the data and so on and so forth. So I don't expect that there will be a one solution fits all. I think that the, the players are gonna be more flexible to offer variety of configuration that go from full on-prem to fully, you know, hosted. And, uh, you know, there's a component that always runs in the public cloud that um, it's it's almost mandatory these days. Um, those are going to be the ones that are the, the winning solutions because you know the the one size fits all model doesn't seem to work at least for the people we talk to. I'm not sure if I answer your question completely, but no, no, I, um, I, yeah, I, I that that was good. Um, so I mean that sort of also translates to the accelerator world, right? I mean there will be ways in which you can deploy accelerators in, in, a, in, a, in a hosted or in you know, as a service environment. But again, when I talked about the car data logger, for example, if that has to be accelerated, this is more of a, the, the kind of a custom deployment and that, that, you know, will not be as a service, right? So. Sounds good. All right, let's see if uh, any other takers. Otherwise I'll ask my second question. So, uh, Tell us about transformers because it looks like it, uh, a couple of the hyperscale companies are investing heavily in this and also China is investing heavily in transformers. Uh, where do you see that in this uh, edge to uh, cloud picture? You mean the model, the yeah, transformer, the deep learning? Well, I mean, model. there is also a lot of silicon investment and, in, you know, just trying to, because of the record, the, the I, I don't think we, we have transformers in that picture where you have the roof line models, right? Uh, no, I think this predates, let me check. Um, yeah, and uh, they're, they're, they're a lot more compute intensive, so. Yes, so I mean, there's um, I mean, everybody has seen this open AI picture that shows, you know, the, the growth of the number of compute cycles dedicated to training. When you look at things like BERT, their derivation, transformers and so on, they're certainly moving to the right here. So if the world moves completely to the right, then, you know, the, where, you know, you got a lot of computation intensity uh, per training data set per training sample, then, then, you know, this concern slows down a little bit. But as I was saying, I mean, 
there are scenarios where these models don't work um, if you want to deploy them, for example, in an edge device, right? So people are looking at ways to compress them or, you know, prune them or sparsify them or whatever. And so, you know, you may end up actually training a smaller model or have a part of your training in the smaller model when you deploy it to the edge. And that's where I think some of the issues will start popping up again. So, I mean, uh, I think we're still early in the days of these model developments. I mean, you've seen, uh, I think Microsoft pushed out this Turing NG, which is like a billion weights. Um, I don't know if that's a way in which we'll end up going. I mean, this seems like a um, pretty extreme view of um, of just, you know, growing the model for the sake of growing it. But, you know, I'm not actually an expert in, in this, you know, core algorithm. So I'd be happy to hear other people's opinion on that. But, um, but again, to me, it's a continuum, right? Again. No, I mean, it sounds good. I mean, I, I also agree that on the edge side, uh, they're, 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 the, the sort of models that are sort of falling off that curve are, are quite interesting. And I think Facebook is also very interested in that. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Any other takers? Please raise Come on, it's looking like, it's sounding like a conversation between me and Babak. That well, we're, we've been working on this. This particular talk is quite inter interesting to us because we have I have a lot of folks in my group who are working in this space. So, um, and of course, we we also work uh, closely on the data center uh, side with with your group uh, in Geneva. So, um, okay. Well, let's see. Last call. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Paolo for this wonderful presentation. Thanks for hosting me. Yeah. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on campus, of course, after all this, uh, this trouble with, uh, you know, with the COVID-19. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone who participated today. I'd like to, you know, special thanks go to Ahmed Yuzugular, my student who basically set up the whole thing, the website, the communication, everything.